Some of you know that growing up, my mother was both a librarian and a Christian bookstore manager. So I learned from an early age to really love books. I began to read them uh, voraciously, began to collect them. Today my library, my personal library has over 25,000 volumes in, in hardback, paperback, and I have another 30,000 volumes in eBooks. So I've got about a 55,000 volume library. Um, uh, in some periods of my life I was reading a book a day. You say, how do you, how do, you do that? You read big print and big pictures. Okay, really tiny, tiny books. But, uh, and in my library uh, of about 55,000 books, as I said, uh, I have several volumes that are interesting that are collections of the last words of people, of famous people, their dying words. And uh, I read them, and while the books are supposed to be serious, some of them are actually kind of funny. I thought I'd share a couple with you. Uh, the last words of a guy named James Rogers. He was a criminal and he was about to be executed by a firing squad, and they asked right before they shot him, do you have any final requests? He said, yes, a bulletproof vest. <laughs> Famous last words. General John Sedwick was a Union commander in the Civil War. Uh, he was killed on the battlefield looking at the enemy while saying, quote, those Confederates couldn't hit an elephant at this day. <laughs> Another famous quote, Pancho Villa. Everybody knows who he is, you know? Famous Mexican leader. Pancho Villa's last words were, don't let it end like this. Tell people I said something. <laughs> All right. Today we look at the most famous last words ever. The last words of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now we have been for seven weeks looking at the seven statements that Jesus made on the cross while he was being crucified. And as I've told you that as a pastor, I have stood at the bedside of many, many people as they said their final words. Last words are important. And when it comes to Jesus Christ, the last words of Jesus Christ are extremely important. And today we come to the last word of the last words. The very last thing before Jesus died on the cross. The Bible says it like this in Luke chapter 23. If you are new here today, you can take the message notes outside of your, in your program and take them out. All the verses in the Bible are there on this text. It says this, Luke 23. By this time, it was noon. Now, Jesus has been on the cross for six hours. Okay. It says, by this time, it was noon, but darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Now, circle the word darkness. We'll come back to that in a minute because this is the word of trust and you really need to learn to trust in the darkest hours of your life. When darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Now, we don't know why it got dark. Maybe just God brought cloud cover over, maybe a storm. It just got dark. It's not normally dark in the middle of the day. That's usually the brightest time. But the light from the sun was gone and suddenly the thick veil hanging in the temple was torn apart. There's a symbolism behind that. We're not gonna get into about making God accessible to us, but it says, then Jesus shouted. So the final words that Jesus says, he shouts out. Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. This is what he shouted. I entrust my spirit, Father, into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last breath. Now when the captain of the Roman soldiers, that would have been a centurion, a captain, of, a captain was overseeing 100 soldiers, when the centurion, the captain of the Roman soldiers, handling the execution, saw what had happened, he praised God. This guy is in no way a believer. But he praised God and said, surely, Surely this man was innocent. And in the book of um, Matthew and in the book of Luke, it adds, surely this man was innocent and the son of God. Now, as a Roman centurion, this is pretty amazing, that a, a hardened soldier would look up and say, the guy we just crucified, surely he was innocent. And something's different here. As a centurion, he would have already have seen literally hundreds and hundreds 
of crucifixions. This is not a new thing. One of the tasks of Roman soldiers was to crucify people, and literally in the days of the Roman Empire, they were crucifying hundreds a day. This is not a novel thing. They crucified criminals, they crucified political uh, you know, figures and things like that. So he has certainly seen hundreds of crucifixions. But this one evidently is unlike any crucifixion he's ever seen. And this hard-bitten, hardened Roman centurion, when he hears Jesus say the last of the seven phrases, he says, he must have been innocent. He must have been the son of God. Something's different here, something's unique. Well, what made this crucifixion so different from all the other ones he'd seen? The seven things that Jesus had said on the cross that we've been looking at now for seven weeks. Nobody ever spoke like Jesus spoke when they were being murdered, when they were being crucified. This Roman centurion had heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. He's never heard anybody being hung on a cross forgiving the executioners who are crucifying him. And yet he heard that. He had never seen anybody refuse the painkiller that Jesus was offered, which Jesus refused. He heard Jesus say the word of assurance to the repentant thief on the cross dying by him, saying, today you'll be with me in paradise. Nobody had ever said that on a cross. Nobody has ever said, Father, forgive them. Nobody has ever said the word of assurance, the word of love, the word of substitution, the word of victory, all the things we've been looking at now for seven weeks. And certainly, nobody had ever shouted in his last breath on the cross, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. Nobody had ever said that before. This is very different. Folks, people don't die like this. Normal people don't die this way. And Jesus actually gave us a model of how to die. I wrote it there on your outline. I don't want to cover it in detail. He was at peace. That is, it was his time to die. He was at peace. He wasn't afraid to die. He died with no unreconciled relationships, which a lot of people do. He wasn't angry. He wasn't bitter. He knew where he was going, he's confident of heaven, and he trusted God with his future. I entrust my spirit into your hands. So actually, there are three characteristics of Jesus' death. Why don't you write these down? First, Jesus Christ gave up his life voluntarily. Voluntarily. You know, when the movie The Passion came out, there was a big debate, who killed Jesus? Was it the Roman soldiers who killed Jesus? Was it the temple religious leaders who killed Jesus? Was it the crowd who killed Jesus? The, the fact is, who took Jesus' life? The answer is, Jesus gave his life. He gave it up. He came for the purpose of dying. He had said that from the very beginning. In fact, he said, nobody can take my life from me. He gave it willingly for you. And believe me, if Jesus had not wanted to die on the cross, because he was, was God in human form, it would not have happened. In fact, here's what he said. Look up here on the screen. John chapter 10, verse 18. Jesus said, no one can take my life from me. He'd done all kinds of miracles. He could certainly do a miracle to come down off the cross. I lay down my life voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also the power to take it back again. So the death on the cross is not a tragedy. It was Jesus' choice. He did it voluntarily. If he hadn't wanted to die on the cross, he would not have died on the cross. And we talked the last few weeks why he had to do that. But it was a voluntary uh, decision. Jesus was in no way a victim. And he was not being victimized. He was in complete control of the situation. And nobody could do anything to Jesus without his permission. Literally, he had the last word with his last word and the things that he said on the cross. So Jesus gave up his life voluntarily. The second thing, write this down, he gave up his life confidently, confidently. In other words, he shouted the word. Father, I entrust my life, I entrust my spirit into your hands. Now, he shouts. Now, let me say this to you. 
I have been around, as I said, a lot of people as a pastor and for 40 years, I have been at the bedside of many people as they took their last breath. And I will tell you this, dying people don't shout. I've never ever heard one dying person shout. They whisper. Not one in my entire life have I ever heard shout. Because in their dying moments, they don't have the strength. And usually they whisper out a few words at the very end. And normally, certainly in a crucifixion, where you're having extreme torture and extreme punishment, and in the last stage of crucifixion, a normal person wouldn't have had the strength to even shout out beyond a weak groan. And when Jesus shouts out the final word on the cross, he's not shouting out in anger. He's not shouting out in bitterness. He's not shouting out in fear. He's not shouting out in despair. He's not shouting out in defeat. He is shouting out in victory. It is a shout of confident, convinced, rock solid trust. Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And he says it at the top of his voice. It's a shout of victory and it's a shout of trust. He gave his life up voluntarily. He gave his life up confidently. And the third thing, Jesus gave up his life trusting God. Trusting God. Now when Jesus says this phrase, the very last of the seven things he says on the cross, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I entrust my spirit. This is actually a quote from the Old Testament. In fact, it's a quote from Psalm chapter 31, verse 5. And not only is it a quote from 31 verse 5, it's a, it's a phrase that every single Jew would know by heart because this is the bedtime prayer of every Jewish child. You know, we teach our children, um, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That is taken from this, this phrase. That's taken from Psalm 31. The, now I lay me down to sleep is actually just a paraphrase of Psalm 31. Without a doubt, Mary probably taught this to Jesus as a little baby boy. Every Jewish child, in fact, Jews would regularly pray this as the evening prayer. At the end of the day, you say, Father, I am entrusting my life. I'm entrusting my spirit. I'm committing myself into your hands. And I'm going to bed. It's a common Jewish prayer. And Jesus uses what he has been saying every night since as a little boy as his last words on the cross. Now, what's going on here? I want you to write this down. He focused on the Father, not his pain. And in a minute, when we get into what to do in your dark days, that's one of the things you need to learn how to do. That when you are in pain, and when you're in your darkest days, Jesus is in his darkest days, he's in the cross, on the cross, it is literally physically dark, he focuses not on his pain, but he focuses on the Father. And he has no fear, and he has no regrets, he has just trust. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Into your hands I entrust my life. Now this phrase that we're looking at today has been said by Christians ever since for 2,000 years. It's very, very common. A lot of Christians throughout history have phrased, used this phrase when they're facing danger, when they're facing persecution, when they're facing ISIS, like right now in Syria, when they're facing uh, discouragement and death. The Latin is in manus tuus, in manus tuus domine, commendo spiritum unum. Into your hands I commit my spirit, Father. And that is, that's a phrase that had been used for literally thousands of years. In fact, the very first Christian martyr, the guy named Stephen, who was stoned to death in Jerusalem for following Jesus, he says a version of what Jesus just said here. And he says, as they were, as they were killing him, uh, uh, Stephen says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And that's the last thing he prayed. By the way, while I'm talking about this, uh, the idea of last rites, that's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. 
It was a tradition added many, many years later. Nobody in the Bible received last rites. None of the apostles, none of the disciples, nobody received last. You don't need last rites to get into heaven. It's a tradition that was added hundreds and hundreds of years later. It's not in the Bible. But Jesus says as his last words, I'm committing into my into your hands, God, my spirit. Now, what do we learn from this last statement of Jesus? Well, every single word has an important truth, and that's what I want us to look at right now. When you are going through your darkest day, there are four truths you need to remember. Write these down. Number one, first thing to remember is I have a Father in heaven who loves me. I have a Father in heaven who loves me. This is the first thing you need to remember when you're going through a dark day. And that's why Jesus starts his last statement on the cross with the word Father. With the word Father. Now, remember a couple weeks ago we talked about that when Jesus was taking the punishment for every sin of mankind on himself, he cries out, my God, my God. Remember that? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's the only time in the Bible when he doesn't call God Father. And that was because he was separated, taking all of our sins on himself. When Jesus taught us to pray, he said, you're to pray like this, our Father who art in heaven. That blew everybody's mind. Because up to this point, every faith, every religion taught that God is distant. God is big, he's powerful, he's cosmic, he's mighty, he may be merciful, but you certainly don't call him Father. But Jesus changed it all. He blew the stereotypes. And he said, when you talk to God, you talk to him like he's your daddy. In fact, the word he used in Aramaic, Abba, literally means daddy, papa. It's, it's the first word every Middle East child learns, Abba. Dada, Papa, it's easy to say. And so Jesus told us, when you pray, start with praying, Father. And when Jesus is dying on the cross, his last words there, he starts with the word, Father. Now, the judgment period for sin is, is all over. He's now reconciled to God. He's not talking of some impersonal force, some uh, uninterested, distant deity. He's talking to Father. The Bible says this, John 16, 28, Jesus said, I came from the Father and I entered the world and now I'm leaving the world and I'm going back to the Father. So what do we know about God since he wants us to call him Father? A lot of people have a problem with this because they had bad dads. And their dad was distant, their dad was demeaning, their dad was destructive, their dad was, uh, you know, detached. Is that the way our Father in heaven is? No. The Bible tells us that God is a caring Father. He's a consistent Father. He's a close Father. And He's a capable Father. And He loves you more than you can even possibly imagine. The Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 13, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord, that's God, has compassion on those who honor him. I don't know what you're going through today. You may be having a financial crisis, a physical crisis, a conflict in your marriage. I don't care, well, I do care, but I mean, I don't know what you're going through. But I would say this, you have a heavenly Father in heaven who is close, caring, competent, capable, and consistent. And he cares. And if you're going through the dark days, you need to get your eyes off the pain and onto the Father. Father, that God who knows everything that's going on in your life, sees everything that's going on in your life, cares about everything that's going on in your life, has the power to change everything in your life, and will help you if you will trust him. I want you to write this down in your outline. God loves me more than I do. That's probably a shock to some of you. God loves me more than I do. Did you know that you don't love yourself as much as God loves you? God loves you more than you love you because God is love. God is the essence of all love. It all came from him. 
And no matter what you are facing right now, you need to say, I have a Father in heaven who loves me. That's how he starts. But he doesn't just love you. And here's the second thing you need to remember. It's in this sentence. Not only do I have a Father in heaven who loves me, number two, my Father can be trusted. My Father, talking about in heaven, the God of heaven, he can be trusted. Now you may have had a physical father who couldn't be trusted. And inconsistent fathers produce insecure children. I talked to a guy one time, he said, I didn't know from week to week whether my dad was gonna slug me or gonna hug me. I didn't know just whether he was drunk or not or whatever, whatever mood he was in. Inconsistent fathers produce insecure children. But your heavenly father is not only one who loves you, he's one you can trust. You can trust him. And this is the word of the trust. Jesus says, Father, I entrust my spirit. I entrust my life into your care. That's why I call this the word of trust. Now, one of the greatest decisions you're gonna have to make in life is this. Who are you going to trust? You gotta make that decision. Who are you going to trust? Who are you gonna trust with your life? Okay, let's just throw out some options and let's vote. How many would say, I think I'll trust um, Congress? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't see any hands going up on that one, okay? Since they're in the bottom of the barrel right now with credibility. Uh, how about, um, I think, uh, I, I, I'm gonna trust, um, how about the media? I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna build my life on what the media says. How about, I'm gonna trust my life to popular opinion? No. How about, I'm gonna trust my life to my emotions? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> How reliable are they? Your emotions lie to you all the time. You know, one of the simplest things that'll help you be a lot happier is this. Realize, you don't have to believe everything your mind tells you. Not everything you tell yourself is true. A lot of times you tell yourself things are worse off than they really are, and a lot of times you tell yourself they're better off than they really are. You, don't, you lie to yourself all the time, and your emotions lie to you all the time, so I would not highly recommend that. Who are you gonna trust with your life? I, I wanna make a recommendation. I recommend that you put your trust into someone who, A, knows everything, uh, B, will always put your interests first, and C, will always tell you the truth even if it hurts. Now there's one person who's always gonna do that, God, because he's perfect. And I wanna suggest that you always put your trust in him. Father, I entrust, I'm going to trust you with my life. I'm going through this dark period right now, I don't know which way I'm going, I don't know which way is up, I don't know where I'm gonna be in the next five days, much less five months but I'm gonna entrust my spirit into your care. Psalm 33, verse four in the Bible says this. For every word of the Lord holds true, and everything he does is worthy of our trust. Friends, you can't say that about anybody. You can't say that about me, your pastor, I love you, but you can't trust everything I do because I'm a fa fallible human being. You can't trust any human being to always do the right thing, but you can trust God. I saw a bumper sticker the other day and it said this. Uh, God said it, uh, I believe it, that settles it. Okay, fine. I'm gonna make a new bumper sticker that says, God said it, that settles it, whether I believe it or not. <laughs> because truth is not based on whether I believe it or not. I could say, I don't believe the moon's made of rock. It's still made of rock. I could say, I believe the moon's made of cheese. Doesn't matter what I believe. What matters is the truth. God said it. That settles it. Whether I believe it or not, I'm gonna put my trust in your word. Now, when Jesus says this, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands, this word, entrust, in, in Greek, it's um, uh, paridithemi. Paridithemi actually means to deposit. It's the word that they would use for a safety deposit box. 
You know what a safety deposit box is. You go to a bank, you, you rent a box, and you put your most valuable property in that box for safekeeping. And in that safety deposit box, it's locked, it's safe, it's secure, and nobody's gonna get at it. And you've made a deposit in that safety box. That's what this word means to entrust. You say, God, I'm gonna take my life, I'm gonna take the good, the bad, and the in-between, the ugly, the beautiful, every part, and I'm gonna entrust it, I'm gonna deposit it in your safety box. And I'm gonna put my life, which is valuable, there for your safekeeping. The point is this, whatever I give to God, I can trust him to take care of. I can give stuff to other people and I can't always trust them to take care of it. But that's one of the things that God says in this verse. I have a track record of faithfulness. And he says, I want you to make a deposit in the safety deposit box in heaven. And I want you to trust me with stuff. So here's the question. What do you need to entrust to your heavenly father? What do you need to trust or entrust to your heavenly father? You say, well, I don't know. Well, let me give you a little hint. Anything you worry about. That's what you need to entrust to your heavenly father. Anything you worry about. You worried about your health? You need to entrust that to your heavenly father. You worried about your future? You need to entrust that to your heavenly father. You worry about your marriage or getting married or having a baby or raising the kids or a new job? You need to entrust. Anything you worry about needs to be entrusted to your heavenly father. I've told you this before. Worry is practical atheism. It's acting like there's no God, no heavenly father who loves you and can be trusted. Every time you worry, it's a warning light. You stop trusting God. It is an evidence of unbelief. It's a failure to trust. Now the most difficult time to trust God, of course, is when you're in pain. Remember, Jesus is on the cross. He's just had six hours of torture on the cross and hours and hours of torture before that. He's in enormous pain. Loss of blood, loss of sleep, no water, dehydrated, bleeding to death. And in his worst pain, he says, I entrust And that's when you're in pain that you need to trust the most. Paul knew this. Look at the next verse. It's up here on the screen. Paul says, I'm suffering here in prison, but I'm not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust. And I am sure, that's confident, I am sure that he is able to protect and keep. That means put in the safety deposit box. I am sure that the one I trust in, he's able to protect and keep what I've entrusted to him until the day of his return. That's what it means to trust God. God, I'm gonna trust you to do what what I can't do. I'm gonna trust you. And the point is that he does the keeping. Now, you know, sometimes I talk to people who say, you know, I would follow Jesus Christ, but I don't know that I could be consistent. I'm afraid I would kind of flake out. I'm afraid that I'd get weak and I'd walk away. I'd like to be saved. I'd like to have experienced salvation in my life, but I'm not afraid that I can keep my commitment. Let me let you in on a little secret. You don't do the keeping. He does it. He does the keeping. You put your life in the safety deposit box. He turns the key. He keeps it safe. It is not your job to keep yourself saved. It is God's job to keep you saved, to keep to make sure that you make it to heaven. And God will save whatever I put in that safety deposit box. Now, a lot of people think, well, you know, but what, what if I let go? I've told you this story before. One time we went to the Grand Canyon, and uh, we, the family, we were there, and Matthew and Josh were little boys, and we walked up to the edge, and I grabbed hold of both hands. And my boys were both, they had this adventuresome spirit. I think they get it from their mother. And, uh, but they were risk takers. And, uh, And they always wanted to get closer to the edge than I would want them to be. Now, they're squirming and they let go of my hand. Do you think I'm gonna let go of theirs? 
Not a chance. Why? Because I am their loving father. And your heavenly father holds on to your hand. Once you come to Christ and you say, Jesus Christ, I'm putting my hand in your hand. I'm trusting you today. He grabs on. Now, there are gonna be times in your life you wanna let go. God, it's not really convenient to believe in you right now. It's not really convenient to follow the word of God right now. It's not really convenient to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I wanna let go. You may wanna let go. He's never letting go. He is able to keep what you've committed. He does the keeping. You just do the trusting. Now, while I'm on this, let me just cover a couple of special um, occasions that people often ask about, and I don't ever get a chance to talk about it. People often ask me, well, what about <clears throat> babies and mentally uh, you know, ill or mentally incapacitated or mentally retarded people who don't have the capacity to believe in Jesus Christ uh, and can't commit themselves to Christ? Where are they gonna go to head, heaven? Where are they gonna go when they die? The answer is real quick, heaven. They're going to heaven. A baby, if a baby dies, or someone who's mentally incapacitated dies, they immediately go to heaven. The Bible says, Psalm 116, verse six, the Lord protects the simple-hearted. One, in one example, I could give you a lot of these. When King David's baby infant son died, in 2 Samuel chapter one, he said, can I bring him back to me? Can I bring him back in? The answer is no. I will go to him someday, but he will not return to me. So if a baby or a child who has not learned the difference between right and wrong doesn't have the capacity to accept the salvation of God's grace, immediately goes into the presence of God. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's one. Uh, here's another question I'm often asked. What about people who were true believers and then later on in life stop believing? Are they gonna fall away? Are they gonna, you know, they kind of fall away from their faith here. Uh, what, what's gonna happen to those people? Maybe they go join a cult or something. Or, and what happens to them? The answer is this. They do not lose heaven. They do lose some reward in heaven. They do not lose their salvation. Now let me explain it this way. I was born into my dad and mother's family. And I was in that family and I had great fellowship with them with joy and love and had a great relationship with my parents. But let's say one day I had decided to become an international drug runner. And I get involved in terrorism and acts of genocide and all kinds of things. The relationship would be strained, the fellowship would be broken, but I don't care if the fellowship's broken, I'm still their son. Nothing will ever make me not their son. If you have a child in your family and your child loves you and grows up and learns to love you, one day they get mad at you, they walk out of the house by their own volition. They walk out of the house, they're still your child. They can't, once you're born, you can't be unborn. Once you're born again, you can't be unborn again. You are safe, does that make sense? You are safe. You, you might lose the fellowship and there might be strained fellowship between us. We're not talking to each other, but you're still my daughter. You're still my son. And the Bible says that. Look at this verse. 2 John chapter 1, verse 7, 8. Many deceivers, there are people out there trying to mess everybody up all the time. Many deceivers who don't acknowledge Jesus as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. So he said, you know, not everything you hear out there is true. Watch out so that you don't lose what you have worked for. Circle the phrase worked for. Watch out that you don't lose what you have worked for. Okay? But that you will be fully rewarded. Now, question. Do you work for your salvation? Huh? No. So if you didn't, this is not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about salvation because you don't work for your salvation. You don't earn it. We talked last week. It's a, it was all done for you. You don't work for it. It's all done. That's the difference between Christianity and every other religion. Every other religion is a do, and they all have their list of do's and don'ts. Christianity says done. It's already been done for you on the cross by Jesus Christ. He did what we can't do. So he's not talking about that. He's saying the rewards that you're gonna have in heaven, you could lose some of those. Let me ask you, this one's very personal to me. What about believers who commit suicide? Okay, and in a moment, take their own life. And the answer is, if they were a true believer, they're going to heaven. 
they're going to heaven. Well, say, isn't, isn't suicide an unpardonable sin? The answer is no, it is not. It is not. In fact, the Bible says there's only one sin that is unforgivable. Only one. In the entire, and it isn't suicide, by the way. In fact, some of the greatest saints in history, in the Bible, were suicidal. Some of them were, were very depressed and despair. Uh, some wished at low points that they'd never been born. David in the Bible, Jeremiah in the Bible, Job in the Bible all said, I wish that I had never been born. That's pretty depressed. And they were great believers. And there were three people in the Bible who actually asked God to kill them, to take their lives. Moses asked God to take his life. Elijah asked God to take his life. Jonah asked God to take his life. That's pretty depressed. And he said, God, just kill me. Okay, just, just kill me. Uh, so if you have felt that way, let us help you. At Saddleback Church, we have counseling that we can help you. We have people who care. We have courses. Don't go through that pain by yourself. In three weeks, we're doing uh, the, the, the big gathering on uh, mental health and the church. And it's a three-day, October 7, 8, 9, and, and world leaders are coming from all over the world, and the Surgeon General of the United States is gonna be here, and about 40 big speakers. If, you're, if you feel that much in despair, you feel that depressed, do not carry it by yourself. It's not a sin to be sick. It's not a sin to feel depressed. We can help you out, and we will help you out. The Bible says there's only one unforgivable sin, only one. It's called blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? What is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? It means rejecting God's grace and rejecting Christ all the way up to death. It means to die rejecting Christ. So let me put your mind at ease, because some of you think, have I ever committed the unpardonable sin, the unforgivable sin? You wonder about that, okay. Number one, if you've ever worried that you committed the sin, you haven't. <laughs> because if you had, you wouldn't worry about it. Okay, so if you worry, I've done the one unforgivable sin, you ain't done it, friend, sorry. The fact that you're worried about it, you're concerned about it, means you still have a conscience. So if you've ever worried about it, you haven't done it. Second thing is, if you're alive, you haven't committed the sin because you can only commit it by dying, rejecting Christ. So if you're alive, you cannot commit the sin. You can only commit it by dying, saying, forget you, God, and I croak, and I die. Does that ease up anybody's mind a little bit here? Okay, you can't, you can't do it without dying. Now, number three, let's go to the third great news. When I'm going through dark days, I have a Father in heaven who loves me, and when I'm going through dark days, I remind myself that I have a Father in heaven who can be trusted. He doesn't just love me, I can trust him with every area of my life, and I shouldn't worry. I should commit it and trust everything I'm worrying about to him. Number three, my Father is taking care of things I can't see. This is the third thing we learn from this passage, is that my Father in heaven is taking care of the things that I can't see. We only see the physical things in life. We only see the material things in life. But we know that there's a lot of things going on in life we can't see. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not real. It's as real as what you see. You're, what you see is limited by your eyeball and your brain. We know, for instance, right now, there are radio waves and television waves running through this building and actually going through your body. You can't see them. But if you turn on a radio, turn on a TV and tune in, you can get the picture. They're there, they're in this air right now. There are all kinds of radio and television waves going through the air right now. You cannot see them. Just because you cannot see them does not make them false. There's far more to life than just the material. There's far more to life than just the physical. In fact, the things that are gonna last are not material. All the material stuff, this chair is not gonna last. One day, it'll fall apart because all material things, according to the second law of thermodynamics, deteriorate. 
This building will one day deteriorate. The trees will deteriorate. And it, your body is deteriorating. Hate to tell you that. But the physical is not getting better. Anybody want to give a testimony of that right now? The, the physical, the spiritual is actually more real. And God is taking care of the things that you can't see. So when you're in your dark days, you can't see the solution. When you're in the dark, you can't see the antidote. You can't see the solution, the problem that's solved. And while you're waiting, God is working. And what you need to do is trust. While you're waiting for that job, while you're waiting for that answer to prayer, while you're waiting for that change, while you're waiting, God is working. And that's why you need to trust. I entrust my spirit. Circle that word, my spirit. That implies that you're far more than a body, and of course you are. Life is far more than material or physical. You're made in the image of God, which means you have a spirit, you have a soul. One of my friends is a brilliant businessman. His name is Peter Thiel. He's a good friend, and, and some of you know who Peter Thiel is. He's an entrepreneur. He's up in the Silicon Valley. He started PayPal, became a billionaire, starting PayPal. And one day I was at one of his intellectual confabs called the Dialogue. It's up held at Sundance in Utah. And uh, there's all these brainiacs, these you know, uh, nuclear physicists and stuff like that. And, and we were in a discussion one day, and Peter Thiel asked me, he said, Rick, with the advent of artificial intelligence, which we know is getting smarter and smarter and smarter, he said, Rick, are, is, are, is artificial intelligence ever gonna need faith and religion? That's a legitimate question. And, and the answer to that, of course, is no. Now, if all you were was simply an intellect, we know that we can create machines right now that are smarter than you or me in certain things. We, Human beings can create me machines that are smarter than us. But you're far more than intelligence. Human being, yes, has intellect, but you have far more than just intelligence. You have spirit. You have a soul. And while we can create greater intelligence, we can't create a soul. And so that's a, it's a question that's not needed. Now, the Bible says that here on earth, there's an unseen battle going on for your soul between good and evil. Let me give you a couple examples where you have to trust. Job says it like this. When he, talking about God, when he is at work in the north, I don't see him. And when he, God, turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. In other words, I don't see God with my physical eyes, but he says, he, God, knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. That dark spot you're in right now, this is a test. And although you cannot see God, he can see you. And God can see what you cannot see. And you can trust God that he loves you, that he cares for you, that he can be trusted, and that he's taking care of the things that you cannot see. Paul says the same thing, 2 Corinthians 4. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, he says, we fix, what is, by the way, what does that part mean? He's saying that the problems you're going through right now, God's purpose is greater than the problem you're going through. And what you need to do is get your eye on God's purpose rather than your problem. That's what it means, Father, I entrust myself to your care. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory, a greater purpose that far outweighs them all. So, he says, here's the solution. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. One last thing you need to remember when you're going through dark days. These are all four important, and the fourth one is this. My father can handle anything I put in his hands. My father can handle anything I put in his hands. He loves me, he's trustworthy, he's taking care of things I can't see, and he can handle anything I put in his hands. 
That's the last part of the phrase. Father, he's a loving father, I entrust, he's trustworthy, my spirit, he handles the stuff that we, the spiritual stuff we can't even see in the spiritual world, I entrust it into your hands. This phrase, into your hands, is a beautiful expression of care and security. You know, there's a well-known TV commercial, you're in good hands with Allstate. Yeah, right, okay, good for you. <laughs> what in the world does that mean? What they are implying is our insurance company will take care of you. You're in good hands with Allstate. You know, my, I have big hands because my dad had big hands. And my dad was a carpenter, and when my dad swung a hammer, and he built all of his life, the hammer seemed small in his hand. He had such a giant hand. And, and I got big hands as a result, but my heavenly father has even bigger hands. Even bigger hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. <laughs> Somebody should write a song about that, really. Okay, I mean, that's how big his hands are. When Kay and I got married, one of the first Bible studies she did was called The Hand of the Lord, and she told me that she discovered over 200 times in the Bible the phrase, the hand of the Lord is used. So I, I just end with this, and you can write this down real quickly. How big is God's hands? How big are they? How big are his hands? Well, write these down. Number one, God's hands are big enough to bless me. God's hands are big enough to bless me. Jesus often put his hands on people to bless them, and in Isaiah 62 it says, the Lord will hold you in his hands for all to see a splendid crown in the hands of God. They're big enough to bless me. Number two, God's hands are big enough, they're strong enough to keep me eternally secure. God's hands are strong enough to keep me eternally secure. If I put my life in that lockbox, in that safety deposit box, it isn't going anywhere. Jesus said it like this, very important verse. Follow me on it, John 10, Jesus says, I give them, that's you, eternal life, and they will never, circle the word never, never perish. My Father has given them to me, and he's greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. You cannot lose your salvation once it's been given to you. Nobody can snatch you out of God's hands. Even Satan can't snatch you out of God's hands. You say, well, you can't be snatched out of God's hands. Maybe you could jump out on your own. How big do you think God's hand is? You think you can get to the edge of it and then fall off? No, God's hand's so big, and you're in God's hands, there's no way you can fall out of it. When my kids were little, I'd get in the pool, and Amy and Josh and Matthew would line up on the side, and I'd say, jump to me, jump into my hands, trust me, I'll catch you. And they were always scared to death to do it. The first time they did just, I don't wanna do it, oh, daddy, daddy, jump to me, I'll catch you, I'll catch you in my hands. Look, I can handle it, all right? And, 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 they, and they were just afraid, afraid to jump into my hands. But then finally, they do it. And when they jump into my hands, of course I catch them. And then they wanna do it 100 more times. <laughs> because once you've jumped into your father's hands, that's flat out fun. And you wanna do it again and again and again. Once you've learned how to trust God with your life, you get addicted to it. And you wanna do it over and over and over, and you want to trust God for bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger things, and that is the story of my life. Because as a little boy, I jumped into my heavenly Father's hands, and he caught me. And at that point, I knew I can trust God. And so I started jumping further and further back, further and further back, and then jumping off cliffs. And every time, he has caught me. And I'm addicted to it. It's flat out fun, trusting God. Trusting the loving hands. His hands are big enough to bless me and strong enough to keep me eternally secure. And I wanna just tell you today this. God, your heavenly Father, is waiting for you to jump. 
He's standing in the pool going, come on. I love you. You can trust me. I'm accountable. I'm, you, can, you can count on my faithfulness. And I'm big enough to handle you. Jump into my hands. You need to do that. And you need to start doing it all the time. There's a third thing you need to know about the hands of God. It's this. His hands are scarred. Yes, the hands of Jesus are scarred with the nail prints so that he cannot forget me. Do you know that in heaven you're going to have a perfect body? There will be no scars in heaven. Aren't you grateful for that? No flaws on your body in heaven. No warts, no pimples, no scars, none. The only scars that will be on anybody in heaven will be on Jesus. From his hands and his head and his side and his feet. And they're going to be there for eternity to always be reminders of us of what he cost, what it cost him to pay for our salvation. The Bible says this, Isaiah 49, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? The obvious answer is, of course not. A nursing mother could not forget her baby. Though she may forget, he says, I'm not, God says, I'm not gonna forget you. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. When you look at the nail prints of the cross, Jesus says, this is how much I love you. This is how much I love you. I love you this much. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. God has a tattoo of you. You get a tattoo of people you love. God has a tattoo of you. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands when they were nailed to the cross. Now, I don't know what you're going through, but I advise you to do this. Last verse. Paul says this. I think you ought to know, dear brothers, about the hard times that we went through in Asia. We were really crushed, and we were overwhelmed, and we feared, we feared that we would never live through it. Some of you feel that way right now. And we felt we were doomed to die, and we saw how powerless we were. But, here's the big change, but that was good. You know the problems you're going through? Those are good, why? For then we put everything into the hands of God who alone could save us. For he can even raise the dead. Give it to God. Commit it. Deposit it in the safety deposit box. Now I mentioned earlier that Jesus was quoting Psalm 31, the greatest psalm. And I mentioned that probably Mary probably taught that Jesus. It's like, well, now I lay me down to sleep. You know, when I was little, a little, little boy, when I'd get scared at nighttime, I'd go in and I'd fall asleep on my parents' bed. I'd actually try to get between them. And I'd try to fall asleep between my parents and, because I was felt safe there. And after I'd fall asleep, my daddy would pick me up in his strong arms and his big hands and he would carry me back to my bed after I'd fallen asleep. And in the morning, I would wake up and something amazing would happen. I would be awake in my own bed. <laughs> Why? Because while I was sleeping, my father would carry me with loving arms to where I belonged. And I've thought about that a lot as that is a perfect picture of what it means to die as a believer in Jesus Christ. One day, you will go to sleep and your heavenly father will pick you up in his loving arms. And he will take you to where you belong for eternity. And that's what heaven is all about. Friends, I know this has been a long message, but this is a theme that you need the rest of your life. It's not something just to say when you're dying. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's something to say every single day of your life. When you are fearful, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. When you're angry, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. When you're worried, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. 
When you're depressed, Father, I trust my spirit into your hands. When you're confused, Father, I trust my spirit into your hands. When you're in despair and you don't know which way to go, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. When you have a big decision, Father, I trust my spirit into your hands. You need to use this theme every day the rest of your life. Let's pray. If you've never said it the first time, you need to say it right now. Just like me saying to the little kids in my family, jump, daddy will catch you. You need to jump into the arms of a father who loves you, who is trustworthy, who is handling the stuff that you can't see and can handle anything you put into his hands. So I invite you to pray a one sentence prayer this weekend. Say, Jesus Christ, I don't understand it all. But with all that I am, in simple humility, I say to you, I entrust my life into your hands. Everything, in your name I pray, amen.